Today's video was brought to you by Skillshare. Shooting 8K on the Sony A1 has been extremely frustrating for me. It's not the camera though, it's the fact that I don't have an 8K display to watch my footage on. This camera outfutured my ass. So naturally, as a 4K peasant, I had a few questions about the 8K workflow on this camera. How big are the files? Can my computer handle them? How much better does downsampled 8K look when compared to 4K? Does the camera burst into flames when shooting 8K? Let's go one at a time and start with something a little less exciting like recording codecs, unless you're into that kind of thing. Over in the 4K division, it's essentially the same options as the A7S 3 It maxes out at 10-bit 422 for every codec, but when we start talking about 8K, we still get 10-bit, but our subsampling now maxes out at 420. And if anybody gets a panic attack from staring at this list, let me break it down for you. If you see HS, that means it will be encoded in HEVC, otherwise known as H.265. XAVCS encodes it in H.264, which is lighter on your system compared to .265. And if you see an I, that means it's using all intra compression. Even better for editing, but larger file sizes. Now that you have a PhD, here's a few key considerations. The all intro format maxes out at 60p, meaning it's not possible to record 120p with all I unless you do it through the S and Q mode. There's also no option to record 8K in 8-bit. It's 10-bit supremacy only for 8K. 8K maxes out at 30 frames per second. It's also not possible to use active steady shots, which is the digitally enhanced stabilization in 8K. Standard IBIS will still work, however. And unless you're recording onto CF Express Type A cards or the fastest SD cards rated at V90, you can only record up to 4K 60p in HS mode, meaning if you're using any cards slower than the two recommended types, no 8K, no all intra, and no 120p. The world's a pretty harsh place for slow memory cards. But regardless of what media we can afford, we've got all the picture profiles available, including S-Cinetone that was previously exclusive to Sony's cinema line, but it's now on the A7S III as well. It's something really nice to have though, especially for short turnaround projects or if you don't plan to color your footage in post. There's always S-Log3 for those who do plan to color grade, but for those who are looking to learn how to color grade, there's a really well-made class on Skillshare called Color Grading for Filmmaking, the Vision, Art and Science. It's taught by professional film filmmaker Dan Dan Liu, and I like how she emphasizes on the creative aspects of color grading as much as the technicals, because as mentioned in her fifth lesson, we're really using color grading to serve a story. But this is just one of the many interesting classes on Skillshare. There's a lot more on film and video, there's also other topics like creative writing and even marketing. Skillshare is our sponsor for this video. They are an online community home to thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people just like us. It's built around learning and exploring new skills, deepening existing passions, and for us to just get lost in creativity. It's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, and being curated specifically for learning means there are no ads on the platform platform so you can stay focused. They're constantly launching new premium classes and the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. We are not exactly living in the age when delivering content in 8K is the norm yet, so if you're shooting 8K these days, there's a fairly high chance you're doing it so you can later crop your image or downsample it for a higher quality 4K. Or maybe just to flex. Look at me, I'm shooting 8K. So let's talk about how much you can crop. The A1 shoots 8K in 7680 by 4320. That is exactly double the dimensions of UHD 4K. So answer is on a 4K UHD timeline, you can crop in up to 200% before you begin losing resolution. Now, what if we downsample it to 4K? Here's a clip recorded on the A1 in 4K. And here's an 8K clip squeezed onto a 4K timeline. If we take a closer look, the downsampled 8K looks significantly more detailed than the native 4K, even though at this point, the pixel count is exactly the same. So if you don't need to shoot faster than 30 frames per second, you could totally roll 8K to later use it as an extra high quality 4K, 
but it will be tough on your storage. This 80 gigabyte card will let you roll about 25 minutes of 8K footage. That's over three gigabytes per minute of footage. For comparison, 4K at the same frame rate and compression cost me just under 800 megabytes per minute. But fun fact, on the A1, 8K is actually not the heaviest format you can record in. The most data hungry is actually 4K 60p all intra. That costed almost four and a half gigabytes per minute. Now what about raw recording, some might ask. The A1 doesn't record raw video internally, but Atomos did just announce that they're developing ProRes raw support for the A1 via the Ninja 5. It'll do up to 4.3K 60p. No word on when it'll be available though. So for now, let's talk about how workable the internal 8K files are when editing. I put them through my 16 inch MacBook Pro. It's the base version of the i9 variant. And I was actually surprised that it played the footage back smoothly because this is HEVC 8K we're talking talking about. Dropping the footage into Final Cut Pro, I wouldn't say it's buttery smooth, but it's definitely workable for cutting. It's nothing like the 4K 120p clips, which I had trouble even seeing what's going on. I'm also not the first person to ever review the A1, so I actually get to consume some media coverage of it. From what I've heard about it so far, it doesn't really overheat as long as you pull the screen out so there is some airflow. The most extreme condition I could think of to test that was under the scorching Malaysian sun, recording in 8K continuously. About 26 minutes later, it surprisingly did not flash into a thunderstorm. Also, the card filled up. But even after that, there wasn't even a temperature warning icon. The camera itself was quite toasty, definitely feverish, but it totally could have gone on recording if we wanted to. I aborted the test after my card ran out because I only had a limited time with the camera and I didn't want to blow it all on the overheating test. I would recommend checking out Gerald Undone and Philip Bloom's coverage on the A1 since they are running way more detailed tests on the A1 regarding thermals. And aside from 8K, the other big appeal for shooting video on the A1 is it's probably its ridiculously good autofocus. Nothing too different from the A7S III here. You still get human eye tracking AF in video across all frame rates. It still works even when outputting to a monitor. But if you want to keep the camera screen on when outputting via HDMI, you need to have the HDMI info display settings set to off. And while we're on the topic of displays, the EVF on this is also magical. On top of being big, bright, and high resolution, it has a 240 hertz refresh rate. You'll really see it come to life when shooting in 120p. The motion through your EVF is simply lifelike. Another concern for shooting video is rolling shutter. Honestly, I was expecting it to be terrible in 8K, and while there certainly is some amount of rolling shutter, it's not as terrible as I thought. The A1 was essentially getting a concussion during this test, so for normal shooting, it really shouldn't be too much of a bother. Down in 4K, it is noticeably better, and I would even say it's excellent. This camera also has surprisingly good low light performance despite its high resolution sensor. Comparing it to the king of low light, the A7S III, the A1 actually had lower noise levels all the way up to ISO 10,000 before the A7S wins itself back at ISO 12,800, which is when it hits its second native ISO. The A1 actually has a second native ISO as well, but it kicks in earlier at 4,000. Watch the noise as we go from 3,200 to 4,000 ISO. It gets ridiculously clean at 4000, so while it might not handle pitch black shooting conditions as well as the A7S, having a clean ISO 4000 is a rather nice sweet spot for most shooting conditions. And for all the amazing things the A1 can do for video, it's crazy that it's also a class leading stills camera. While it certainly isn't cheap, it sure covers you for both stills and video. If you're looking at it purely for video, however, it's still not a cinema camera, so some features you'd take for granted on cinema cameras are simply absent. There's no tally lights, for example, and your exposure assistance is still limited to histograms and zebras. There's no waveform monitor or vector scopes, the screen's not the biggest nor the brightest, but being also a stills camera, it does come with its perks that one wouldn't typically find on a cinema camera, like weather sealing, which can be an important asset on a documentary shoot, and of course it's a ability to double as a stills camera. So this is my review of the Sony A1 for video. I will also be reviewing it for stills in an upcoming video, and I'll link it up here when it's already available. Otherwise, you could also check out my 8K cat video shot on the A1.